Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. As you can see from my title, I'm going to serve you a fish dish. And I'm going to talk about prognostic significance of copy number gain of meek locus detected by routine clinical fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis during diagnosis of large B-cell lymphomas. I have nothing to disclose. So, and I like to start my presentations that yes, there is a lot of transitions from previous WHO to new WHO, ICC to new ICC, but overall what's very important is prognostic significance and also therapeutic significance of finding we can identify. So you can see this is very typical, typical Kaplan-Meier curve and in the population of patients, we all always have a distribution, those who are responders, those who are resistant. And the best way to achieve ideal remission is to know precisely prognostic risks at every time of um, disease course. Uh, and if we talk about large B-cell lymphomas, there is a significant evolution of testing modalities and subclassification of lymphomas over these 20 years. And you can see that from immunohistochemistry, which so nicely uh, picks um, for example, MIC and BCL2 protein level as well as proliferative um, index K67. And in this case, if it would be both activation of MIC and BCL2, this case would be uh, named double espressor. Fish analysis is the next uh, cornerstone method, which is still widely used uh, at the time of diagnosis of large B cell lymphomas. And you can see that chromosomal structural rearrangement of um, either MIG BCL2, BCL6, LASI are very instrumental in prognostication. So those who are not familiar with interpreting fish results, uh, here I show illustrative images for break apart probes. So three prime, five prime uh, portions of uh, lock is labeled with different fluorophores. So in case uh, if locus is intact, I cannot see from this angle, but this is a fusion. I believe I'm pointing at fusion. That would be intact locus. In case of structural rearrangement, red and green would separate. And that would be positive for MIC rearrangement. That would be single hit. If you identify a case with MIC and BCL2 coinciding, that would be double hit. And if all three proton cogens are rearranged, that would be triple hit uh, lymphoma. And why it's so important? You can clearly see how survival is drastically different between classical lymphomas, which don't express MIC and BCL2 and don't have translocations, versus double espressors. Remember previous picture with high protein level, but again, no translocations confirmed by fish or molecular method. And this is double hits. So this is very important to um, subclassify how to go back. Um, at the same time, very often when we report fish results, we do detect gain of copy number. And it's very variable, so some laboratories notoriously report it, some do not. We do, we do put it as a line. No rearrangement, however, such a number of copies noted. How to interpret it? So, and I did get quite a lot of questions from oncologists. Is it high risk, is it not? How we can stratify it? Um, there is a great interest within a couple, um, last five years, you can see quite a number of papers. However, results are very um, contradictory. Some papers report that yes, it is high risk. Copy number is high risk. Some papers state no, there is no difference from classical um, uh, large cell lymphomas. So what we did, um, <clears throat> We collected retrospectively all uh, large B-cell lymphoma cases diagnosed at Northwestern uh, within last eight years. Uh, and you can see on this slide the criteria for grouping uh, those cases. So cases with, I always press the wrong button. So cases with translocation, single head, that would be MIC translocation. Cases with MIC and BCL2 and BCL6 would be double hit. Uh, cases with high copy gain, and you see images of um, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which illustrate cases from each group. That would be high gain. Uh, and you're still able to score. We did have one case with unscorable. It was cluster, which you can comfortably call amplification for sure. These are cases with what we call low level gain. 
and we grouped together cases with three, four copies. Everything that had normal copy number uh, grouped in this uh, category, and then we split it upon request of oncologists in two groups, double expressors, those which still expressed me can be cell two, um, versus those which did not. So now we have multiple categories. It's very complex. We collected over these three years enormous amount of data. In the interest of time, I'm showing just few slides. So we're trying to publish it. If there is an interest, please feel free to find me. I'm happy to talk about other results outside of this room. So what was very exciting for us and reflects actually excellent work of pathologists who assessed and quantified MIC and BCL2 protein expression level by HC is we correlated it with previously published RNA-seq data which placed copy gains kind of in between of classical lymphomas and double hits, assuming that, yes, it's not as high as double hits, but a little higher than classical. And we actually see the same result. So you can see this is high gain, and this is 3-4 copy, these are single hits, double hits, and it's all statistically significant. So that was exciting. Of course, we collected demographics, data, treatment, everything, everything, everything. No significant difference, but I'm happy to talk uh, about it later. So what I want to show you is survival rate. Uh, so we calculated overall survival and progression-free survival. Progression-free survival was assessed as a time from the time of diagnosis to the time of disease progression or elapse after period of remission. So what was interesting and a little bit disheartening, we did see that yellow is a high copy gain group. They uh, trend to also be between classical, which are shown in green color, and you see red double hits. However, we didn't reach statistical significance and we blame uh, not enough sample volume in our study. However, for progression-free survival, it's all statistically significant and you can see that high copy gain, and I specifically labeled it so it would be visible what you need to look at, uh, aligned with double espressors. So from this data, we can conclude that progression-free prediction uh, for survival that High copy gains, at least, will definitely behave as double expressors. And if you look what was interesting, even cases with three, four copies, which we, upon reading literature, assumed, okay, this is probably a tetraplagization event. It's very common in elders, but it's also very common in um, large lymphomas, and there is also a lot of interest how to assess tetraplagization. Even these patients behaved a little worse than control group. So then pathology resident who worked with me on this uh, project, he was not satisfied with absence of over overall survival significance. He uh, hypothesized that, no, it cannot be like that. It has to be some dosage effect. So we had a lot of discussions about what, how much is enough to show dosage effect. So he did um, his very... Uh, bioinformatics savvy. He did a lot of statistical assessment with bioinformatician. I'm not going to pretend I even understand what specifically they did, but he came back and said, look at these images. Uh, if you have this number of copies, not significant, this significant, significant, boom, our magic number is seven. And I said, okay, okay, let's do it. Let's regroup. Now it's not five, it's seven. So what we did, now we split all patients who had copy number gain into group with less than six copies versus group with more than seven. And guess what? Progression-free survival and overall survival now is comparable to uh, cases with MIG translocation. So that was very interesting. So as a conclusion, MIG copy gain is frequent and worth attention. In our cohort, yes, this is institutional bias. I understand that what we saw from literature, it's variable numbers from 5% to 25%. So in our cohort, copy number gains, we see in approximately 20% of patients. Uh, in, again, our population of patients, uh, it's as frequent as translocations. So now 
it clearly justifies that we need to pay attention even if there is no much understanding how to treat these patients and how to change management, it's worth tracking, right, and collecting information. Definitely, it's important probably to have a little more frequent follow-up for these people to pick um, disease recurrence on time earlier. Um, clearly, patients with mid copy number again have uh, worse progression-free survival. And intuitively, we believe that even overall survival is also worse, we just need to have a bigger cohort and do this statistical recalculation, and most likely we will reach statistical power. Um, right now, for high copy gain, we have roughly about 40 patients. That's not a whole lot. Um, and definitely dose-dependent. Dosage-dependent effect of uh, MIC takes place. And uh, it might not be completely true that it's uh, seven copies because we had to play with this whole dosage effect to identify if it's truly poor prognostic marker or just variant of unknown significance which we can just push on the bottom of a report and forget about it. So definitely it's worth reporting. We're happy to report and we will continue reporting. We are one of those labs which report a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, in addition, what was interesting, so now when we are trying to publish this paper, and um, unluckily to us probably, so both reviewers are oncologists. So we got so many questions about effect of radiation, how it influenced, what proportion of patients in addition to standard treatment, which in our institution is probably in many other places are CHOP versus EPOC. So we continued. Thank you for your attention.